government are. What's interesting about this particular place is you can rent out the room under the dome and have a dinner in there. So it's kind of fun to have a dinner in a palace. So you can do that. So it's a tradition. The president of the ESCRS always picks either a palace or a castle or something to have their dinner. And so they had their dinner right under That's that dome. It's dinner. <laughs> it's pretty cool because you kind of eat and then you go, oh, there's a dome up there. And this is the one on the other side. So there's matching uh, bookends here. And then in the middle, there is a, a, a statue with the obligatory fountains. And this is uh, Maria Theresa. She was the queen of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And not only was she queen and expanded the empire, but managed to have 11 living children during her reign. 11 that lived. I think there was three more who died. And several of her daughters were married off to try to um, you know, intermarry all of the European royalty to keep them from attacking each other. And so um, one of them, uh, of her daughters was Marie Antoinette, who was the um, unfortunate um, wife married off to Louis XVI when the French Revolution happened and, and kind of lost her head in the guillotine. So this is the statue to Maria Theresa. All right, this is the opera house. And so this is the... Uh, the main opera house. And what's interesting is they've got a big screen TV around the corner there, and you can actually sit your chairs out there and watch it outside the opera on the big screen TV. And of course, here's Mozart, um, <laughs> and you can see he's checking out his uh, emails there. And so Mozart, Mozart's come into the 21st century. So, you know, I love how the sunglasses and the, uh, you know, and the, the cell phone, the obligatory cell phone. So even Mozart's, you know, modernizing. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the lens. And so I think we need to go back and spend a little bit of time on the uh, pathology and the embryology of the lens. So Tina, what embryologic layer does the crystalline lens come from? So it comes from surface ectoderm. Surface ectoderm. So if you guys remember that very first lecture when we talked about the lens, you get the outpouching of neuroectoderm, you know, which is going to form the uh, most of the eye. It comes forward, it touches the surface ectoderm. What happens is, is this induces the surface ectoderm to start proliferating. The surface ectoderm will then proliferate and you'll get invagination of the optic cup. And then eventually the surface ectoderm will pinch off and it will form the crystalline lens. And so the crystalline lens, remember, surface ectoderm derived. And here it is in, I think these are chick embryos, if I'm not mistaken, which look just like human embryos, you know, for the first few weeks of gestation. And here it is just in a schematic. Now, what's interesting is once it pinches off, you will form a circle, and then the fibers on the posterior part of the circle will then begin to proliferate, and they will fill that circle and make the lens solid. The reason that that's important is as the lens grows throughout life, you do not normally have lens epithelial cells posteriorly. And so if you do have lens epithelial cells posteriorly, something's going on. That's either pathologic or abnormal. So normally you have the cells, when the lens grows, will go out to the equator and then fan out. But they do not um, normally have endothelial, have not have nuclei posteriorly. And here's a picture of that embryologically, as the, and this is human, and as the cells will grow from the posterior surface, they'll grow anteriorly, and then eventually the crystalline lens becomes solid, and that becomes the embryologic nucleus. Now the crystalline lens grows throughout life, much like you're putting yarn around a ball. And so throughout life, the center part of the lens gets more and more and more condensed, and then the periphery grows more and more. Also as you go throughout life, that lens comes from round to a more oval shape that you're used to seeing. And here you can just see a lens in a slit lamp. It's a biconvex, so the easy way to think of that, football shaped. You know, biconvex, football shaped. And here it is um, in a pathologic section. You can see that, you know, it's really hard to tell by the time you get to an adult, but there really is a compacted embryo, embryo, um, embryologic nucleus in here. You've got a fetal nucleus, you've got an adult nucleus, then around that you've got cortex, around that you've got capsule. And here you can again see that in a, in a schematic view. 
so the embryonic nucleus, the, the regular fetal nucleus, the nucleus, and then of course surrounded by cortex and then surrounded by lens capsule. All right, so what are we showing here, Chris? So here we're looking, um, I think the top picture is the anterior capsule, the bottom picture is the posterior capsule. Um, we can tell that because there's these epithelial cells on the, uh, on the top picture. What's, what stain is this? Part of the PAS because it's capsules of basement membranes. So. Exactly. So remember, our PAS stain is the stain we use to um, discern a basement membrane. It'll stain that nice magenta color. So there's the anterior capsule, posterior capsule, epithelial cells anteriorly, none posteriorly. Now, note the thickness of that posterior capsule. That's just a few microns thick. That's all there is between your 30,000 hertz ultrasound jackhammer and vitreous. So please respect that capsule when you're doing surgery because that's all there is that keeps the vitreous back where it should be. And so very thin, and if you look, you see that the anterior capsule is about 50% thicker than the posterior capsule in a normal eye. What are we illustrating right here, Catherine? It sure looks like the lens and it looks like it's more compacted in the center um, and then you can see the anterior capsule because it has the uh, lens of helial cells. Actually the anterior capsule would be up on the roof here. Oh, okay. So what part of the lens are we looking at? Why would I be showing you this? I'm not sure. This is actually the equator. And so what we're trying to illustrate here is what we call the lens bow. And so when the lens is growing throughout life, the, the lens epithelial cells are come out here to the equator. Once they hit the equator, instead of migrating all the way back, they'll migrate along the disc, you know, along the edge of that on the inside, and they send fibers both anteriorly and posteriorly. And so when the lens is growing throughout life, the nuclei come to the equator, the lens bow, then they fan out all the way around. Some fibers go anterior, some fibers go posterior. Now, what are we showing? What are we showing right here? It's on needles that attach to the capsular bag. Okay. And the um, part of the ciliary body that it's connected to. So when the zonules attach, we think of them as attaching at the equator but they really do go a little bit anterior and a little bit posterior. So you have to be careful if you're doing a capsule of rexus, you, know, you don't want to make an eight millimeter rexus because you can get out into where the zonules attach. But what I also wanted to illustrate on this is, what are these down here? Ciliary processes. Those are the ciliary processes. And so when we say that you know, the zonules insert on the ciliary processes, not only do they insert on the ciliary processes, but some of them come clear the heck back here I'm sorry, this battery's dying, but they come clear back here and they almost insert clear back here almost to the pars placata. And so the zonules anchor to the ciliary body, but all the way back, some of them attach on the ciliary processes, some of them attach even between the ciliary processes. So the lens is supported very nicely by the zonules, 360 degrees, and think of them as springs on a round trampoline. And so they go all the way around, and they tend and they support the um, they support the crystalline lens nicely. What are we illustrating here? So this is a lens suture, and because it's a Y, I would assume we're looking at the front of the lens. Okay. So when the fibers come in, um, again, that lens is not perfectly round. It's becoming a little bit more oval as time goes on. So those fibers that come anteriorly and posteriorly, they can't really meet at a point. So because of that, they end up meeting, they form this Y. And so when you're looking at lenses, you know, your, your mission today when you're at the VA or at the U and you're looking at you know, lenses through the slit lamp, look for the sutures. You, you can see them every time. We don't pay any attention to them because we don't really look at them. But look for the sutures and there'll be, there'll be a Y and an inverted Y. You can see an anterior and a posterior um, Y suture where those fibers come together. And so you can see this just illustrates it right here, how it kind of forms a Y instead of a single point. Now this is just trying to show you those cortical lens fibers. And when you look at them in uh, cross-section, what does this remind you of? 
Yeah, looks like a honeycomb almost. And so you see you've got these, they're almost hexagonal. And they've got all the, the organelles, they've got a lot of proteins in them, there's a lot of proteins in there. But remember, the nuclei are out at the equator, it's sending the fibers anterior and posterior, so there's no nuclei at this point, it's just the, the content of the fibers that form the lens. Yes? So is, there, is it one cell that extends anteriorly and one cell that extends posteriorly? No, they, but they send them both ways. So the nucleus will send them both anterior and posterior, and they kind of meet in the middle there. So this is what it looks like. It's almost like a hexagonal looking little or oval looking honeycomb. All right, what are we showing here? It's an external photograph of, <clears throat> of the eye. So it looks like the, the lens is dislocated and with the anterior IOL in place. Actually, what is that? So uh, the lens is subluxed. Okay, so the lens is sublux, but what was the second thing you said? Is it a, was it the, the capsule? It's actually just a fake it contact lens. So this, this round thing that you see right here, that's a, a, a fake it contact lens. So this patient has the um, lens dislocated, and it's dislocated superior temporally. Does that um, have a particular entity that's classic for that? Marfans, and so this is a Marfans patient. And so I don't know why, but Marfans, it's a zonulopathy. It's a weakness of the zonia, just like a weakness of connective tissue elsewhere in the body. But for some reason, the lens will dislocate superiorly temporally. Now, you know, if I were to think about it, I'd say, okay, wait a minute, the lens, the zonules are weak, it's going to drop down. But it doesn't. It, it dislocates superior temporally. That's kind of anti gravity, so I'm not sure why that is but it's a sign of a diffuse zonulopathy. And so sometimes if these patients are doing okay and that lens isn't moving around a lot or causing inflammation, you can just fit them with an AFA kit contact and they do okay. And this is that patient. And, and I've been following this guy for years. Um, you can see he's about 6'11", he's got long spindly fingers. And um, because Marfan's is a, is a diffuse disease of, of um, connective tissue, these people are at risk for such things as aortic aneurysms, aortic arch aneurysms, things like that. And so this was this actual guy. And this is so old, this picture. This is before there was a Moran. This is when it was on the, the, you know, the eye clinic was on the A level of the old hospital. And so that's one of our original texts. And you can see this guy was 6'11". And he went for almost 20 years before that dislocated lens caused problems and he had to have a sutured PCI well. But, he was wearing AFIC contact lenses for that whole time. Okay, now, Tina, this is another picture here. I had to borrow this out of a textbook. So we see the external photograph, and you actually see that the lens is subluxed. It looks like probably infranasally, um, which would be more consistent with the homocystinuria. Exactly. So again, why? I don't know. I mean, for some reason, you just have to memorize it. Marfan's is superior temporal, homocystinuria, inferior nasal. Why, I don't know. But again, signs of a diffuse zonulopathy. So weak zonules and eventually it dislocates. All right, what are we seeing here? We see an external photograph. Um, there's definitely some injection in the eye in a bit. Um, so the lens looks pretty opaque and it, it looks anterior to me. Yeah. It looks like it's in the bag. So, what entity do you have where you can get a spontaneous dislocation of a lens anteriorly? Um, now say this was, you know, trauma, you can obviously get dis yeah. dislocation of a lens traumatically, but let's say this was spontaneous. Yeah, spontaneous things in um, like microspherospachia. Okay, so how do you, and then uh, what is there an entity where they're really famous for microspherophagia? Um, like one of those other things you have to memorize. It's a, it's a eponym. Uh, wheel, wheel something. Oh, that's half. Good. Wheel Marcazani. So Wheel Marcazani syndrome, and it's kind of the opposite of Marfan's, because Marfan's are tall people, long spindly fingers. Wheel Marcazani are short people, short stubby fingers, and so kind of the total opposite of Marfan's. But they tend to get smaller lenses, spherophagia, and then, but again, a zonulopathy, and so they are at risk not for that dislocating posteriorly, but dislocating anteriorly. So Will Marcazani, spherophagia, short people, short stubby fingers, so kind of the total opposite of, of 
Marfan syndrome. And here you can see, I'm sorry that's out of focus, um, this was one that actually spontaneously dislocated into the anterior chamber. Can you dislocate for those in the capsular bag? They're still within the capsular bag, exactly. So the entire lens, you know, those onions a week, the entire lens will dislocate. All right. Um, this I'll give you a hint. This is a child. Okay, what are we showing here? Um, so the eye itself looks smaller, and okay. particularly the one on the, or the slice. This is actually one cut in half, so don't, don't worry. It's cut in half. And the lens itself looks, um, looks more uh, spherical. Okay, so again, spherophakia. What's another entity where you can get spherophakia in kids? Exactly, and so this actually is one. I pulled this out of an old file. This is congenital rubella. And thank goodness it's something we don't see much anymore. But we may. I mean, you know, there's this feeling now that vaccines cause autism and cause everything, so there's a huge amount of our population not being vaccinated. And so we're just, you know, one outbreak away from seeing a huge amount of, of you know, rubella come back again. But um, one of the things with congenital rubella is that you get... Uh, spherophakia once again. They don't really dislocate, but these kids just don't do well. Their eyes are smaller than normal, their lenses are smaller than normal, and they have other problems, CNS problems associated with the rubella. So, but you just need to remember that congenital rubella is another cause of spherophakia. And what you need to memorize about this also is sometimes they retain the nuclei within the cells in congenital rubella. So when you look at some of the pathology, those nuclei are retained more than you would normally see. Would you, you wouldn't be able to see that any differently on the gross specimen? No, no, this, you'd, have to, you'd have to have light microscopy to see it. You wouldn't be able to see it either with slit lamp or, or you know, grossly when you look at the kit. All right, what are we looking at here, Rachel? So this is using It's hard to tell because with the retroillumination, you can't really see slit lamp. You know, you can't see depth. But that is actually dead center. So that is actually a fetal nuclear cataract. So this is, or you know, people may call these congenital cataracts. They may call them infantile cataracts. But this is actually a cataract in that fetal nucleus. The rest of the nucleus, which comes out to here, is clear, and the cortex is clear. So it's just in that fetal nucleus. And so this is a congenital cataract. So congenital cataracts can affect all parts of the lens, but in this particular case, it's a congenital nuclear cataract. What I thought was interesting about this is, this is, is got the, um, that's kind of the male symbol there, and then this is kind of the female symbol there. So I call this the Prince cataract. Can you remember Prince before he died? He was, wasn't sure if he's male or female, so he became this symbol of both. And so. That's what this has. So this is kind of the Prince cataract. So this is a congenital nuclear cataract. <coughs> and here's just another one now with the slit lamp on it. So what you see is, you can see here's the edge of the pupil, and you've got this opacity in the center of the nucleus. The adult nucleus is still clear, and the cortex is still clear. So if these are bilateral, and they're not too dense, these people can grow up and have pretty decent vision, actually. If they're unilateral and dense, they get severe amblyopia. So if you've got a child with a unilateral dense cataract, that's a real emergency. You've got to get that out of there right away. But if they're bilateral and they're not bad, sometimes these people grow up, and I've had several people make it into adulthood. And I mean, they're not 20-20, but they've got functioning, you know, 2100 vision. Now, what are we looking at right here? So you can see the, um, the there's kind of a fibrous um, band posteriorly. I can't really tell if that's... That's some condensed vitreous here and even a little liquefied vitreous here, but what do we see in here? I didn't see where you were pointing. The whole lens here. The whole lens. Um, so it just looks pretty um, dense and... Uh, cataract, 
I mean, yeah. <laughs> so this is what this is. This is a dense nuclear cataract in an adult, and so you see that that nucleus is taking up almost the whole lens here. This is just a dense, you know, nuclear cataract, very very dense. And then we kind of look at it from behind. This is the Miyake view, and you're sitting at the optic nerve looking behind. Here's the zonules, and you see in the center part of the nucleus, it's all white or yellow. And so this is an adult nuclear cataract. The most common type of cataract that we see actually is a nuclear cataract in an adult. So this is the nuclear cataract in an adult. Pathologically, it's interesting, we really don't even look at these anymore because if you look at a lens nucleus, you know, with just light microscopy, whether or not it's a dense cataract or not, if compared to someone of the same age, it looks the same. And so it really just doesn't look that different on, on um, you know, doing H&E stain and, and, you know, light microscopy. What are we seeing right here, Shroff? It's like a brunescent of a brunescent cataract. Okay, so brunescent or brown-like. Um, this is kind of the end stage of a nuclear cataract. They become very, very brown. Some people even call these black. And so it's rare that we see these in the first world. I mean, if we see them, it might be from parts of Wyoming or something. But, yeah, no, no comment. <laughs> I'm from Wyoming. You're allowed to make comments of your own kind. That's not considered prejudicial. But, no, it's really uncommon in the U.S. to see a cataract this dense. If you see them, it might be from someone who's, you know, a mountain man or a rancher or somebody who doesn't like doctors and, you know, doesn't come in for 20 years. And so, but this is a third world cataract and these are not uncommon. And so you can imagine if you're, you know, you're, you're on one of our um, international, you know, cataract missions, you know, fakeing that's going to be really, really difficult. And so this is where the, um, you know, small incision manual extra cap surgery really comes into play. It'll be interesting to see now with this new MyLoop that we're starting to, to play with to see if a MyLoop can cut a lens that dense. So it'll be interesting to see. I, I don't know. We haven't done them yet in cadaverize that dense, but hopefully it'll be able to do it. But in any event, this is a hard nucleus to fake. You know, you really want to maybe remove this hole. All right, and this is showing you on light microscopy. This is a nuclear cataract and again you really can't tell a whole lot of difference there between just a normal adult cataract. All right, what kind of cataract are we looking at here? It's like a cortical cataract. Okay, so illumination we're seeing spokes. So you see the spokes and that's the classic thing in a cortical cataract is it'll start peripherally, come centrally and it'll look like a pie or a spoke. So you'll see spokes or you'll see pie shaped wedges and it tends to be white tends to be more fluffy looking rather than yellow or brown. And of course it's more peripheral, both anterior and posterior. So this is the classic cortical cataract. And then this is looking at it from behind. Again, you see the spokes. So there's the classic spoke. I mean, there's a little bit of nuclear cataract in here too. Yes? So it's the same lens epithelial cells that make the dense nuclear cataract and the cortical cataract? Yeah, it's, it's the fibers. There aren't any nuclei oh, left yeah. or they're in that central nucleus. And so that central nucleus, it's just the empty fibers. And then, you know, within there, there's lots of proteins. The proteins will start to denature. They'll start to cross-link. There's other elements that start to get in there, and then they become harder and become opacified. And how they kind of are laid down in relation to each other over time? Is that how, whether you, is that determine whether you get a nuclear or a cortical? That's the million dollar question. If we can understand that, we could prevent them. I don't think we fully understand why. Yep, that's a, that's the good question. I would love to have that answer because then we could stop cataracts before they, you know, before they happen. Now, when we look at cortical cataracts, what we see is a little bit different than the nuclear cataract. These fibers tend to get swollen and they tend to get liquid in between them. And so if you look right here, these spaces here are all liquefaction. And so with cortical cataracts, not only do the fibers, you know, become opacified, but they become swollen and you even get liquid in between. So sometime when you're in surgery with me, we have a cortical cataract, I'll show you. Every once in a while, they'll even have little bubbles in them. It's kind of fun. You press on the capsule and the bubbles all move all over the place. So I'll show you if you're in surgery with me. But so cortical cataracts, you tend to get liquefaction and those fibers will liquefy and then you get liquid in between them. That's why you get that kind of fluffy white appearance to them. 
And here you can see more posteriorly, again, I'm sorry it's not that clear, but again, all this space is, is fluid. So you get a lot of fluid in here, you get liquefaction of the cortical fibers. Okay, what are we seeing right here? So this looks like the nucleus has become so dense um, in the area around it that it's almost kind of fallen down in the bag there. And what allows it to fall down? Because the it's it's so dense compared to the liquefaction around it. Okay, the key word you said is liquefaction. So in an end-stage cataract, not only is the nucleus dense, but the cort cortex liquefies. And so as a result, the lens tends to sink down into the intact capsule still. What do we call this cataract? Uh, intermesic cat No, um, that would not be it. Oh. Not a Vernessent. Is it Vernessent? No, I can't remember. It's more gagnian. More gagnian. So you have to remember that term. It's more gagnian. And so more gagnian is a cataract where the cortex is so liquefied that the dense nucleus sinks in it. Now, the capsular bag is still intact, but you see it's wrinkled and a lot of fluid can leak out of the capsule, even though it's intact. So you get a lot of fluid, even proteins leaking out of it, but it liquefies and it sinks down. And so one of our fellows thought that it kind of looked like a sunny side up egg. And so there you see, so the Morgagnian cataract, kind of like the sunny side up egg look to it. And so that's kind of the end stage cortical change where the cortex liquefies so much, it's just totally water, and then the nucleus sinks in it. And this actually shows you one that we had removed. Here's that dense nucleus. Here's the capsular bag, not much cortex left in it. And it's really <coughs> tough to take these out with an intact capsule because the capsule's really soft and wrinkled and these are real, real bugger to remove. Of course, Boopy would say, bugbear, bugbear. Does that cause more downward traction on the zonules? Is it, it, it does. The zonules get really loose with this as the bag shrinks, and so the zonules aren't really intact in an end stage Morgagnian cataract. All right, what are we looking at right here? This is a Sillian photo. Um, we see this. It's like a posterior opacity on the lens. <coughs> Excuse me. <Yeah. laughs> All, right. All right, so this is now more posterior because we've got the slit beam in there. So what kind of cataract usually do we see posterior? This is a PSC cataract. PSC or posterior subcapsular. And so these tend to be more in the center. They tend to be, sometimes they can be round, sometimes they can be irregular. And it almost looks like kind of fish eggs or ground glassy look on there and then you can do them in retroillumination and again these really show up well in retroillumination. There's a little bit of a close-up so you see it's got kind of that ground glassy look to it, kind of that salmon egg look to it. Here's just another one, you know retroillumination is a good way to look at this. Now remember I said there's normally not lens epithelial cells along the posterior capsule. Well. Here you see, now I usually ask you what's wrong with this picture. Well, what is wrong with this picture? Well, we see epithelial cells. Yeah, but what's, yeah, well, why is that so, but it's upside down. And so remember, we always usually have anterior up, posterior down. So that's upside down. So that's the posterior capsule on the top, and there's lens epithelial cells there. Not only that, but you see nuclei in them, and look at these big swollen cells. They call these, um, bladder cells or vedal cells, you know, with a W, W-E-D-L, I think, vedal cells. And so when you get a posterior subcapsular cataract, you get an abnormal proliferation and migration of lens epithelial cells along the posterior capsule. Then they get very swollen and, and fibrotic. And so they're called the bladder cells, the swollen cells. Catherine, what are some systemic entities that are associated with posterior subcapsular cataracts? Sure. Most common one would be diabetes. Oh. So people with diabetes, high blood sugar can get posterior subcapsular cataracts. Uh, Rachel, what are intraocular entities that can be associated with PSC cataracts? Uveitis or inflammation. And so PSCs are interesting because they're often not just you know, coming with aging as other cataracts do. And so 
diabetes, systemic entities like that can give you that. You can get them in any kind of inflammation or uveitis. Anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis, you can get PSC cataracts. Other things. Surgery, can you, well, actually, if it's retinal surgery, the cataract most commonly is nuclear, not PSC. You can get, yeah, get PSC. You can get PSC. What's another um, large group of, of potential etiologic factors that can cause PSC cataracts? Um, intraocular tra trauma, those sort. Different, different group. Something else could cause them all. Radiation more often or steroid use? Steroid use. And so, okay, what I want to think about is medications. And so you can get PSC cataracts from um, things like diabetes, systemic diseases. You can get it from inflammatory problems within the eye. You can get them from medications, the most common being corticosteroids. And so people who are on systemic corticosteroids can get PSC cataracts also. So you want to always remember those are three big groups that can cause PSC cataracts. Now this is kind of interesting. What are we looking at right here? <clears throat> Give you a hint. Here's the iris up here. Yeah. So it looks like the uh, epith either the capsule or epithelium of the lens uh, is kind of pro proliferation uh, anteriorly. Now it doesn't look like a PAS stain. This is kind of still an, an H and E stain. And so you see the lens capsule is still intact anteriorly, but there's all this stuff going on underneath it. So indeed, this is called an anterior subcapsular cataract. So not as common as posterior subcapsular cataracts, but you can get anterior subcapsular cataracts. And what it's characterized by is for some reason, these anterior lens epithelial cells get stimulated. They undergo a fibrous metaplasia. So this is a trichrome stain, and what it does is it shows you that these lens epithelial cells have start laying down collagen. And so basically they undergo a fibrous metaplasia and you get this sub, you know, anterior capsule, focal cataract, anterior, um, you know, instead of a posterior um, subcapsular cataract, this is an anterior subcapsular cataract. These are pretty uncommon. You can see them congenitally. Um, it's interesting, you can see these after a phacic posterior chamber IOL. So we don't put many of those in, fortunately, here, but occasionally it's called the ICL. It's a phacic lens that goes between the iris and the lens, and if you get one that's too flat and, and kind of scrapes on that lens capsule, it can disrupt the metabolism, you get a focal anterior subcapsular cataract. All right, so we're kind of changing gears completely. Tina, what the heck is this? A gross picture. Um, the lens appears to be sort of misshapen. It's not round. It's more kind of horseshoe shaped. But I can't tell if there's fibrous banding coming from the back. Um, hard to tell on this, but you can see that you've got this kind of, again, in this, let's see, we've, we've cut that a little bit. It's not, it's not cut completely, but this would even look like a big donut if you looked at it completely. So what could this be? Is it a donut because of the connection to the hyoid or no? No. Anybody? This is called a summering's ring, and so this can occur in two ways. First of all, you can have a traumatic rupture of the lens capsule. You lose a lot of your intraocular contents, but there's still some lens epithelial cells in the periphery. They start to proliferate, and you get this donut proliferating. Now, when we first started doing extracapsular cataract surgeries in the uh, early 80s, you know, we're very good at doing it, and so we're leaving behind a lot of cortex in the periphery, and then again, these lens epithelial cells will proliferate, and you'll get this big donut of proliferating lens material in the fornix. So here's what it looks like. This is a Miyake view again. This is an eye from the early 80s. Here's an old IOL in here, and look at this proliferative cortex. Now, we say this is old, but we just took out a dislocated IOL that had dislocated in the vitreous and had a whole summering ring associated with it that we took out separately. So 
It's just proliferation of the lens epithelial cells that are in the fornix. No matter how good of a cataract surgeon you are, you can't get all those lens epithelial cells out of the fornix. And so you may not get a full summering's ring, but you'll get some proliferation in the fornix and the periphery. So summering's ring is what this is called. And summer, not the season, summering's the Englishman, S-O-E-M-M. E-R-I-N-G-S, Summer Rings was his name. And you can see this is just a uh, you know, later one. This is now a three-piece IOL, but again, you see this hazy donut of proliferation, this Summer Rings ring that's still there. Even with a well-done, more modern cataract surgery, you still see that to some degree. Here it is in cross-section. In cross-section, it looks like a dumbbell. And so you can see that it's proliferation of cortical material in the fornix on both sides, and then of course the lens capsule in the center is still fairly clear. It doesn't really go across the center. It's limited to the fornix on both sides. Here you can see this is a trichrome stain with the anterior and posterior capsules even fusing in that area. This actually is a rabbit, but just to kind of illustrate the point <laughs> here. All right, um, Chris, what are we seeing here? This is an external photo. Kind of uh, whitish deposits, so kind of right there at the pupillary border, and then um, also a little bit more uh, as well. Um, kind of just a white, almost fluffy thing. What is this consistent with? So it's exfoliation. Okay, so it. this is something that kind of crosses between lens and glaucoma. And so, in fact, at one time they used to call this pseudo exfoliation of the lens capsule. The lens capsule is really not you know, where this disease comes from. It, it's made, this material is made from a lot of cells in the anterior segment of the eye. And so it just happens that this exfoliative material deposits on the anterior lens capsule. Why does it have this kind of bullseye appearance? Um, so we see the deposits in two areas. I think be, from what I've been told, it's because the iris, as it uh, dilates and constricts, it, it kind of causes chafing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like a windshield wiper. So when the iris constricts and dilates, constricts and dilates, it pushes that exfoliative material around. So it's, usually you see a ruffle of it near the pupillary border and the periphery, and you'll see a little bit centrally, and that kind of denotes where the iris moves in and out. So this material is deposited on the lens capsule, but it's not the lens capsule itself that's abnormal. So it's just kind of the innocent bystander that's sitting there. Here you can see a really nice so in that picture, it's got that kind of scalloped edge look to it. Now, this is very common in, in Utah. Um, this is a disease that we see more frequently in people with Scandinavian and Northern European ancestry. And, you know, you look at the Salt Lake City phone book. You know, I had a neighbor named Peterson. I was trying to look up his phone number. There's like eight pages of Petersons, let alone Sorensons. And, you know, so a lot of people in Utah have roots in Northern Europe, and that's where this disease is seen more frequently. So. We see lots of exfoliation here, so you guys will see tons of it. There you can see a nice retroillumination view, kind of that scallop look, look to it. But again, sometimes it can be subtle. Sometimes you see just little ruffles of the material just sitting at the pupillary border. So it, it's, it's very subtle, and it's asymmetric. So sometimes people say they see unilateral exfoliation. There is no unilateral. It's a bilateral disease, but it can be very asymmetrical where you see a lot in one eye, you hardly see any in the other eye. And this is what the pathology looks like. They call this the iron filings. And so I don't know if you ever took a magnet and some little iron and you grabbed it and those little iron filings sit up on the magnet. That's what this looks like pathologically. So it's on the anterior lens capsule and you've got this little exfoliative material sitting on there. Now this stuff gathers in the trabecular meshwork so you can get severe glaucoma. It deposits on the zonules. You can get weak zonules. It weakens the capsule. You can even get this in endothelial cells. You can get this in the sphincter muscle and the dilator muscle. So this is, you know, ambiguous in the anterior chamber. The reason that this is important is if you're gonna be doing cataract surgery, you kinda of got a triple whammy. The zonules are bad, the capsule's weak, and the endothelial cells can be affected. Oh, quadruple whammy, and the pupil doesn't dilate. So these can be difficult surgeries. You have to be really careful, and you really need to plan ahead of time when you're operating on people with exfoliation. So we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get to the glaucoma lecture.
What do we see <coughs> in here, Catherine? Um, it looks like this is a lamp photo, and it looks like in the interior capsule there's some um, they're peeling of the interior capsule or some separation. Yeah, look at that little. It's almost like there's a little scroll, if you will, of anterior capsule. What the heck is this? Um, so it could be um, separation of some of the layers of the anterior capsule or okay. exfoliation. So this is actually true exfoliation as opposed to pseudo exfoliation. So initially, when people were first describing these, they called it pseudo exfoliation because they thought it was somehow related to a problem with the lens capsule. So this is so-called true exfoliation. This is very rare. I have seen two of these in my career. So very, very rare. This was the second one. This was classically described in people who were glass blowers. And you know, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures. People take that molten bowl and they blow on it and spin it around and they make this nice big glass on it. Well, that puts an intense um, infrared heat and, and you know light from that and that will make the anterior lens capsule fragile and make it scroll. The other people we, we would see this in is people who work in, in uh, blast furnaces, you know, making steel. Again, intense heat and, and infrared. But you know, now a lot of that's getting um, automated so we don't see it. This lady had no exposure of anything. I have no idea why she had this. So this was, um, Sam Maskett sent me this from LA and this is his video during the surgery, and you can see here's this scroll. He hasn't started the capsule rexus yet. So he got in there to do this lady, and he said, wow, this is really weird. Look at that. There's this scroll on the capsule. So he, you know, Sam being the smart guy, he said, hey, this is something really interesting. So he carefully did a rexus around that and preserved the anterior capsule and sent it to me. And so we did this, and sure enough, there's the anterior capsule, there's the lens epithelial cells inside of it, and look at this split. There's actually a schesis, a splitting of the anterior capsule, so this is called true exfoliation. And we put this in iWorld. Do you guys get the iWorld? You know, it's the academy thing you get, and they'll always do a cool picture of a case at the end, so this was a cool picture one month. And so this is really nice because this is the only pathology I've ever gotten on true exfoliation, very uncommon entity, but again, you got to know it for boards. So true exfoliation. And there you can see, here's the lens epithelial cells, here's the anterior capsule, and look, it splits. There's actually a lamellar splitting and it scrolls. So as opposed to pseudo exfoliation, which is not really in the lens capsule itself, it's a deposition on the lens capsule. This do you have like we're thinking, you know, it's heat and stuff from glass. Does this have like pathology as well? Interestingly, you don't, it's, which is really weird. You don't. So it may, I think it's more infrared than, than actual heat heat, but it's infrared and heat. But these are so rare. As I said, when you see two of these in, in like 35 years, I mean, this is really, really rare. All right, I guess we're back to what the heck are we seeing here? Rachel. So you get a, it looks like you have. give you a hint. This hurts. Pressure's 50. Wyoming rancher. Actually, take it back. This guy was a Nevada rancher. Mm -hmm. So, since we're in a uh, Len lecture, you can get um, you can get lens material that leaks and clogs the trabecular meshwork and cause pressure spikes. Exactly. What do we call this entity? It's not phacolytic, it's the other one. No, it, it's actually phacolytic. So it, it's kind of a misnomer. Phacolytic means like lens splitting, but what's weird is this is almost like you would see in a Morganian cataract, but it's a mature cataract where the cortex is liquefied and the proteins leak through the capsule into the anterior chamber. And so you actually get leakage of proteins, then you get a macrophage reaction to it, and you can get a severe unilateral glaucoma. And so if you look, that cornea is cloudy, that the reason it's injected, the pressure's 50, you get this fluffy flocculent stuff underneath it. So this is what they used to call phacolytic glaucoma. 
So what kind of cells are these? Believe it or not, these are macrophages. And so macrophages come in and they start eating up the protein. And so then they're like little Pac-Man. You know, they go rah, 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 and they start eating that up. And look how swollen they get. You get these big, fat, swollen macrophages. They are so big, when you see these patients, if the cornea is clear enough of the slit lamp, you can actually see cells, I mean, pretty big cells floating around in there. So the problem is, is these macrophages are engorged with protein. There's protein floating around here anyway, and they clog the trabecular mesh, so you get a severe glaucoma. So the treatment is you actually evacuate the whole lens, but you flush the heck out of the anterior chamber. You get all this material out of here. So again, this is a sign of a hypermature cataract, leakage of proteins through an intact lens capsule. Then you get proteins and macrophages. Again, if you want to be smart, you say macrophages. So you say everything with a British accent makes you sound more intelligent. So you, um, you, know, you go ahead and you get this and you get a severe glaucoma with these. And so the key is you just evacuate that and it'll take care of it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this again in the glaucoma lecture. So a couple of entities, exfoliation and the uh, phacolytic glaucoma that are a link between lenses and glaucoma. So the proteins, are they used in the capsule? They actually diffuse through the intact capsule. Yep, proteins and fluids diffuse through the intact capsule. Becca, so this is, this was like your last surgery here in the, uh, what, are, what are we seeing here? Yeah, so um, I think there's an, looks like there's an IOL uh, kind of hanging out, um, displaced, Oh, look at that haptic. It's kind of in front of and the... And this is not an ACIOL. So Iris, this is a PCIOL, all right. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so we've just got IOL dislocation anteriorly through the limb, through the iris, prob maybe from trauma, um, and then there's some maybe a little cortical material or some right Yeah, in fact, quite a lot of cortical material. So this was a, a difficult surgery, ruptured capsule, Thought they had the implant in place, it wasn't. A lot of cortex left behind, didn't get cleaned out properly. So you could get a severe inflammation from, you know, a cataract surgery that's been complicated. You've got, even without that IOL in the anterior chamber, if you had all that cortex left over, you get a tremendous inflammation. And people kind of call this a phacal toxic uveitis. And so it's, it's an inflammatory syndrome. You can get severe glaucoma from it. And if you, you know, you've got it, surgery, what was difficult surgery, you've ruptured a capsule, you can't get all the cortex out of there, you get this inflammatory reaction. Again, they kind of call this a phacal toxic uveitis, but you can get this inflammation. These guys can get a really severe glaucoma, very difficult to treat, and oftentimes you have to just clean out everything. You have to take out the IOL, do a complete vitrectomy, and then end up suturing an IOL to take its place. This is not the same as the um, phaco anaphylactic that's a misnomer. Just stole, you just stole my pimp questions for Shrav, so. This looks like Kratic person. So what she said, <laughs> what she said. So you can thank your colleague there for taking that. All right, so speaking of phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis, and so this is that other double misnomer that you, you know, have to memorize. And so phacoanaphylactic, anaphylactic means IgE, you know, mediated inflammation, and endophthalmitis means infectious, so it's not infectious. This is, again, a kind of an autoimmune inflammatory reaction that you can get. Now, interestingly enough, this entity, phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis, was seen a lot in the 1920s. And believe it or not, people were doing crude extra caps in the 1920s, no microscopes, loops, kind of tearing the capsule and trying to flush out the, you know, the cataract and, and weren't very successful. So you're seeing this a lot. And then people started going to doing what's called intracapsular surgery, where you actually broke the zonules or eventually dissolved them with alpha chymotrypsin and remove the cataract whole with the lens capsular bag intact. We call that intracap. And that's how people did surgery for the better part of 30 years, 40 years even. And so only when people started going back to doing extra caps, late 70s, early 80s, we started seeing phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis again. And so it's interesting. It was a total historic entity until we started seeing it. 
And so what you see right here, what are we showing here? I can still pimp something here. Uh, those are uh, karyotic precipitates or, or mutton fat KPs. Exactly. So these are the big karyotic precipitates. And what do mutton fat K KPs have in them that, that make them so big like that? Even more than that, they have even like macrophages too. And so they have not even just lymphocytes, but even macrophages. So you've got these big mutton fat KP on here. And this was a globe, unfortunately, was lost because of phacoanaphylactic enophthalmitis. And you can see this huge ring here around the area. So this big cyclic membrane, you know, in the area of the ciliary body, in the area of the lens capsular bag. This patient even had an organized hypopia on here from chronic inflammation. This inflammation was totally localized around the capsular bag. Now, you can get this from trauma also, <clears throat> not just from surgery. So this was a, a guy who got kicked in the head by a horse. So ruptured his lens capsule. This is what's left of the central nucleus here. Ruptured lens here. This is all exudated retinal detachment. You can see, unfortunately, he's going into tysis bulbi at this point but he had, again, a phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis. So people are trying to get away from that term because, again, it's a double misnomer, and some people are just calling this phacotoxic or something like that, but it's in the literature, and so you just need to know it. Now, again, very uncommon. We haven't seen these now as we've gotten better at doing cataract surgery now and removing all the cortex and not causing an, an, you know, an inflammatory reaction. But what's interesting here, this is uh, another traumatic case, and here is the central leftover lens. Here's the lens capsule rupture, and here's the inflammatory cell reaction around it. Now remember when we were talking about um, granulomatous inflammation, we had said that the third type of granulomatous inflammation is, is the you know, focal type around a ruptured lens capsule. And so this is a zonal type. You'll get, you may even have some lymphocytes in the middle, and then you'll have some giant cells around it, so you'll get kind of a zonal inflammation. And here you can see again, here's macrophages coming in here, just trying to munch up that liberated lens cortical material from the traumatic cataract. So munching it up here, and then around that, you'll often see lymphocytes, so have kind of a zonal granulomatous inflammation. And here is a little piece of lens capsule that was ruptured, and it's got some little macrophages. Let me see, there. One more. Yeah, there we go. There's actually a macrophage kind of sitting on the lens capsule, munching that lens protein material. So this was a cool case because we published this in 1984 when I was a Dave Apple fellow, and this was the first time that it had been published again for since 1924. So I mean, it was literally 60 years between when this was published. And then again, it's kind of faded away now because gotten much better. But double misnomer, but you do have to remember, phacoanaphylactic endophthalmitis, it's due to large amounts of liberated lens proteinaceous material that then incites an inflammatory reaction. That's it. Okay, there's the opera house at night. <clears throat> I guess Mozart was in there working instead of <laughs> his cell phone. Questions on lens. between um, the, the phacoanaphylactic and the phacotoxic uveitis? So is it, is it just like some people are unlucky and just happen to have a more robust response to the cortical material? Yeah, you know, phacotoxic is more when you've had a cataract surgery, you've left cortical material in there, maybe there's vitreous mixed with it, and then you get this uveitic reaction to it. Not as Whereas robust. phacoanaphylactic enophthalmitis, they even think there's even some immune reaction that's associated with that. But you know, they're probably along the same spectrum. It's probably just total amount of liberated cortical material and how it's liberated that, that decides the inflammation. One more question. Sorry, I have a lot of questions today. Um, so the posterior capsule opacification, is that the same mechanism as like Elschnig's pearls forming? It is. Okay. So when people talk about posterior capsule opacification, it's not the capsule that's opacifying. It's lens epithelial cells, again, from the fornix growing along the posterior capsule postoperatively. And that will cause that capsule to opacify. So when you do the YAG laser, you're creating an opening in the capsule, but it's because you've got these cells and this fibrotic reaction along the posterior capsule. Elschnick pearls are lens epithelial cells that have grown anteriorly instead of posteriorly. And you'll get these little salmon eggs 
kind of at the periphery of the anterior lens capsule where the capsulotomy is and even going out into the pupillary space. We see a ton of these in, in rabbits. We don't see them so much in humans. But yeah, so if you've got a lot of anterior proliferation of lens, ep lens epithelial cells, you get what are called Elschnick pearls. And those are very rarely or ever visually significant? Yeah, they're usually not, unless they come all the way across the pupillary space. And they're pretty uncommon in humans. You see them a lot in little kids. You know, you do cataracts in youngsters and you see them in rabbits a lot. All right, so next week you get a reprieve because Monday's a holiday, so no lecture Tuesday, but Tuesday the 29th, we're actually talking about history of IOLs. So there's really nothing in your book you can read, so you guys get a reprieve. And we're going to talk about IOL history, not we're going to stop 20 years ago. So nothing modern. This is all going to be history.